Okay, I think we're ready to get started. Welcome to everybody who's joining us for the webinar today. Um, we'll be talking about metadata tagging in education with AEP and Creative Commons. I just wanted to go through a few little technical um, issues and how we're going to handle the webinar today. All of the attendees are muted, so if you have any questions or comments, please send those to me through the dashboard. Um, we're also going to gather all of the questions, and we'll do a question and answer session at the end of the presentation. So I think that's all I have, and with that, I'll turn it over to Charlene Gaynor to get started. Thanks very much. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us um, on our, I think, very interesting and important webinar this afternoon. We have got um, over 170 people um, signed up to be with us today, so that's a very good sign, we think, that this is something of um, importance. So I'm going to be presenting along with my co-presenter, um, Greg Grossmeyer, who's the Education Technology and Policy Coordinator at Creative Commons, an overview of the project, um, what our progress is, what its purpose is, and of uh, what our roles are, and of course we will have plenty of time for your questions, which we think will be uh, the most important thing. So I will start by talking about the uh, LRMI initiative, which I'm sure most of you know something about already. I'm, I'm hoping that you do, and that's what has stimulated your interest in participating. Um, the, the, the LRMI, as, as we have uh, come to call it, is actually a, um, an initiative of the AEP and the Creative Commons. Um, it is an, an initiative that is supported by the Gates Foundation and the uh, Hewlett Foundation. I'll, I'll, I'll reiterate that shortly. Um, and its goal really is to build a common metadata vocabulary for educational resources. Those of you who were present at um, this year's CIC in June um, heard us make this announcement, and we had a number of folks, including a variety of launch partners, uh, representatives from companies in the industry who have already uh, signed on to express support for the project. And, and really, the, the reason why I think it's realized quite a bit of acceptance and support in, in concept, at least, is that the notion of improving um, discoverability is certainly um, one that everyone can benefit from. Dave, you can give me the next slide. Um, so for those of you who are, uh, you know, on the publishing side, obviously, having having educators and learners find your content easier and precisely what they're looking for faster um, is a benefit. Next. But of course, for the students, there's an incredible benefit, the idea of being able to find ultimately just the right content at the right time and, and with, with the end goal of improving learning outcomes. And again, oops, can you go back a minute? Again, for us, you know, in the industry, this can have a lot of benefits, including, you know, decreased production costs if there is a common standard, um, instead of trying to satisfy multiple standards. And this, of course, is something that that um, the states have been talking about as well. And then, obviously, the expanded marketplace for educational content. Next. So what I'm really excited about is that this is this is a, a, a shared initiative that AEP and, and Creative Commons are, are co-leading. And one of the things that I think is exciting about that is that, as, as many of you know, there have been quite a few initiatives um, in the past, and um, some of them have been much more complex, and some of them have been, in some ways, uh, much more vertical. Um, but one thing that this project attempts to do is to bring a variety of voices to the table. And we think that by working together, we have a, a, a very good chance of ending up with an outcome that, that will actually be beneficial all the way around. 
So obviously, um, while we both have clearly defined roles, and I'll, I'll describe those, um, we also, I think, have done a pretty good job of coordinating and collaborating so that um, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're both making sure that our, our various constituents' voices are heard throughout. Our role is primarily um, communications. That's something that we do um, on a regular basis. Uh, next slide. And so, of course, that includes not only making sure that um, the information about the project um, is is out there in the in the public domain, um, but also making sure that you know publishers understand the project. Um, you know, we hope support the project, and and also you know that feel that they have plenty of opportunity for us to help liaison back. Um, with what their issues and concerns are. Next. And then, of course, um, Creative Commons is overseeing the technical specs. Um, Greg will be talking um, about that in some detail uh, next. Uh, but I think the main, the main work, um, in a nutshell, is that they have convened a working group. That working group has already had its first um, actual face-to-face -face meeting, and that um, you know they have identified the, the, their work as creating this vocabulary, this common vocabulary that, that will become the framework for um, the, the, the LRMI results. As I mentioned, it's funded, this, this LRMI initiative is funded um, by grants from uh, Bill, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, um, which is where AEP has been engaged, and then both Gates and w William and Flora uh, Hewlett Foundation on, on the Creative Commons side. Um, what really precipitated this kind of why now uh, was the uh, announcement by the three major search engines, um, Bing, Yahoo, and Google, of the publication of sort of a generic framework called schema.org. And um, I, again, I think Greg will be talking a little more about that. But the general idea is that they, they agreed that this foundational framework would be one that they, they would all use. And, and so the impetus of of that decision has obviously very immediate uh, consequences, implications for anybody who wants to be found by a search engine. So from that moment in time and that, and that uh, uh, announcement, I, I think that the Gates Foundation recognized that this was a moment in time for uh, for the learning resources industry to sort of come forward and and use this foundation as the framework for creating their own uh, industry specific vocabulary uh, I, many of you have heard us use the the potato salad reference um, and I, I think that uh, I'll just quickly I think I think Greg's going to give you an example of that but clearly you'll see that um, and it's obvious that in education, you know, it's not potato salad. We need to figure out our own vocabulary and one that would be specific enough to to make the framework um, meaningful. So, with that said, I'm going to turn it over to Greg and, and let him go a little bit um, more deeply into the the framework and and the working group and um, where we are and what we're hoping to accomplish. So take it away, Greg. Thank you, Charlene. So we've thrown around this term a little bit, metadata. Um, let's just be very explicit and so we know, all know what we're talking about here. So metadata is data about data. You know, there's a book out there called Tell of Two Cities. So we're not talking about the content of that book. We're talking about the description of that book, you know, the title, the author, publication date, pages, uh, what the Library of Congress subject heading is under, things like that. Um, so that is what we mean by metadata. Um, so, yep, thank you. Um, so, Charlene also referenced this potato salad example. Now, if we start to tag things with metadata, then the search engines can figure out more nuanced information about those things. Um, so, in this example, you can see it. You can do this right now, in fact, if you wanted to. You can search Google for potato salad, and websites that have incorporated um, schema.org metadata on their own page 
or recipes can now get the benefit of, on the left-hand side there, you see that ingredients list. Um, so a part of the schema.org metadata is a list of ingredients for a recipe. Um, what this means you can do is then do a faceted type search where you can check yes or no to certain things, like do you want your potato salad to have mustard or potato, or obviously potatoes, mustard or dill or celery, those kinds of ingredients. Um, and then it will change the search results based off of your preferences. So next slide. Um, and basically, for, for those of you that might be interested in, in what these things actually look like, this is a little snippet of code, um, HTML code, that includes this, this metadata um, markup. Now, the part that's uh, bolded there, you can see, is in the first part says item prop, which is short for item property. And it says, this next property is of type director. And then the scope of that property is of type person, schema.org slash person. So you can see that, you know, it uh, encases that director word, and then the next line down, it's, you know, the genre of science fiction, and this whole thing that we're talking about is a you know, type movie. So it's just basically um, taking the things on a website that are already visu visually there that the user is reading, um, but then just semantically marking it up a little bit so that the search engines know what the user is seeing. Uh, next one. Um, so the responsibilities of the working group, the technical working group, um, that Charlene kind of over, over gave an overview of, is produce that common metadata vocabulary for learning resources. Um, and what we that's what, what the main um, first steps that we had during that face-to-face -face meeting, I think it was September 8th, where we all gotten together in Mountain View, and we we're trying to scope what those terms will be. Because um, in the world of metadata, there's things that are common to all things, right? Title, um, data was created, the description, where it lives in the world, like a, a URL or, or something else. And those things aren't education specific. But what we want to concern ourselves with are the things that turn a resource, just any old resource, into a learning resource. What are those special characteristics or attributes of things? Why? would I be searching for that in a learning situation, right? Um, and I can get more into detail of what we have decided those terms are um, and where it might fit within within your current um, metadata framework. But we can say that toward the end. It, it might be over the head of some, but not enough detail for others. So we'll, we'll give the gloss, and then we can get deeper later. Um, so we're going to do that, and then we're going to create a proposal, a specification that will be the highly detailed document that will describe these different terms and their definitions and supported values, and submit that to schema.org, um, the organization. So that process, um, we just found out yesterday, or no, sorry, two days ago, in fact, how that process will happen. Um, there's going to be a public mailing list that is co-run by schema.org and the W3C organization, who will um, help facilitate this process. It gives it a little bit more um, uh, goodwill among the community to have both organizations involved in this process of extending schema.org. So we'll submit our proposal to that public mailing list. There'll be discussion there, and then there'll probably be some side discussions with, you know, um, improvements we can make with, with whoever. Um, and then that will go until there's a conclusion, um, most likely a, a positive conclusion. We don't have a definite date for when the final decision we made. We have a timeline of when things will be submitted, but you know the, the final decision is, is somewhat out of our own hands. Um, but then after that, after it's been submitted and approved and, and incorporated into schema.org, um, we will work towards the long-term governance of this standard. You know, it, it's one thing to produce a new metadata schema, but the really important part is to make sure that it stays around and evolves as things change within the world. Um, there's a reason why schema.org is here is because they were taking the best parts of all the other ones and making a new framework that actually worked better for their use case. So we need to make sure that as time progresses, the needs and, and the wants of our communities are, are still um, addressed. Uh, so next slide. Um, this is the list of who is a part of our technical working group. Um, I won't read it to you. You're, you're more than capable of doing that yourself. Um, but you can see that Mike Winkster and I are the co-chairs of this. Um, 
Mike, they're, one of the reasons is that the Mike Linkster has uh, many more years of contacts and experience than I do, but um, I will be the one that's making sure that all the things actually get done. Um, but you also see on this list that we have a lot of good experience from other metadata um, groups and organizations like Dublin Core and um, Jess Cetus, um, people like that, and, and Dan Brickley, for those of you who don't know, is is very involved in the RDFA and, and microformats community. So we have a lot of great experience here, and we're also reaching out to others as as needed, you know, when when we can and when we need to. And Greg, can I just can I just point out that yeah. um, one of the things that I think is a, a you know a, a really important and sort of illustrative of the desire to you know have it be a, a as open a project as possible is that we AEP had asked for and and um, and actually have three appointees on the technical working group as well: Randy Wilhelm from NetTracker, Lee Wilson from PCI, and Michael Johnson. And we think that that's really a um, Really, very important because besides the technical expertise, we have the voice of an interest of um, publishers very much ingrained in the development process. Yeah, exactly, and their their contributions have been have been more than valuable. Um, there's all sides of this, and I, it actually it's beginning to feel weird for me to refer to it as sides um, because this group has pretty much coalesced to be a, a single working group, and there's no distinctions really between. The parties, so it, it's it's working as best as it can, in, in my my opinion. Uh, so yeah, the advisory group is um, a group that kind of is layered on top of the technical working group. Um, it, it involves others, the, the launch partners, and things like that that can um, help the technical working group work towards its goals and make sure that we're staying on track and 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 actually hitting the goals that the entire organization has. Um, and here's the project milestones and, and the outlines, uh, or the uh, uh, timeline of the project. Um, as you can see, it basically was started back in June with the announcement. Um, there was an initial face-to-face -face on August 1st. Um, we announced the composition of the technical working group August 12th. Um, and 17th, we had our first teleconference group. So you can see things were starting to snowball pretty quickly there. Um, and then there's the, I don't think it's listed here, the September 8th. Um, face to face working group meeting that we had. Um, go ahead and next slide. And then, um, right, then there were, we were at, we talked about LRMI at the Creative Commons Global Summit, which was in Warsaw, Poland this year. Um, there was a lot of great interest within the Creative Commons community and, and others um, who wanted to know what was going to happen with metadata online for educational resources. Um, so the next few dates are the really important ones, so they're they're in the future, right? So those ones have to have to meet and, and make sure we make it to those. Um, so in November is when we want to submit our proposal to schema.org, um, and then at that same time start to develop the list of early adopters. Work with those people that will be um, adopting early and make sure that it they can be it incorporate support for LRMI in their own systems um, during this process of submission and approval um, just so they can be ready to go as soon as it's finalized. Um, and then in December and January there will be the public comment period of, on that schema.org mailing list and then hopefully by January, February, March there will be the final decision. Um, those last few dates are a little bit wishy-washy now um, as I mentioned before because of the public comment period but we will most likely hit those dates. Uh, next slide. So we are trying to make sure that this whole process is as open and transparent as possible. Um, there haven't been a whole lot of conversations on the technical working group that can't happen in the public, so we're making sure that those are happening in the public as much as possible. Um, of course, we're keeping the logistics about when people are available and what times we should make the phone calls for private just so we don't you know, clutter the the airwaves, but um, for the most part, everything we do is, is out in the open. Um, and I think we have, yeah, the next slide is the ways to get involved, how to be a part of this process. Um, so one of the most important things is to submit a use case or a sample of your existing metadata or schemas. Um, the deadline for that is the end of the month, uh, September 30th. With that, what we will do is make sure that our proposal to schema.org hits all the main points of 
all of our community members, and community members in this case is broadly educational publishers, creators, consumers, um, and make sure that the, the metadata schema that we propose fits their needs. Because um, if it doesn't fit their needs, then we didn't do our job, right? So as many of those use cases are submitted, the better. Um, there is a call for use cases that you can see. It's on the um, Lermi LRMI group, Google group, that URL, that groups.google.com group slash LRMI. Um, one of the messages back in August, or, or I think it was like August 28th, was the call for use cases. Um, it has a, a template that you can fill out there and submit, and it will basically just be an email to me. So it won't be public initially, and I'll make sure that um, anything that you do submit will be shared with the technical working group. Um, ideally, that we'll also share that publicly. So um, make a note if you do share anything with us, with me initially, if any parts of it are proprietary and you don't want it to be widely spread. Um, and I will, of course, honor that. But then if, as much as you can, share publicly the better, just so the rest of the community can see the work we're doing. Um, and then as we, oh, I don't think we discussed it, actually, the lrmi.net is going to be the domain for where all this stuff will live once it's launched, and it'll go live at the end of the month. Um, and then, of course, moving forward, there'll be more webinars and more discussions and, and all kinds of more contacts that you guys can interact with us as things progress. Um, and then presentations at, you know, conferences and whatnot. Um, so, right. This, I think I handed over to Charlene to do the, the big closing. Well, I don't know if this is the closing. I think this is a ho hopefully the opening because we think that, um, you know, the most important thing is that we get your questions answered. We had, um, I said last week, uh, just a telephone conference discussion that um, that Lee and, and Randy and uh, Michael were uh, present on, and, and um, I'm not sure actually that they are with us today, but we certainly, I think, between the, the, the two of us can uh, begin to answer just about any question you have. So perhaps we should open it up now for um, questions. Yeah, we can certainly go to questions now. We did get quite a few from the audience, so that's great. Um, I'm just going to read the questions, and then Greg and Charlene can um, decide who's going to answer them. So the first question is, does IMS Global have such a vocabulary? That's a very good question. Um, there are a few vocabularies out there already. Um, there's IEEE LOM, there's ISO L and the LR that's coming out shortly. There's the, um, uh, what's the one I'm blanking on right now? Um, yeah, but there, there's I mean, those are just two, but there's multitudes of these educational metadata frameworks that have been in use. Um, even Dublin Core has its own educational subsection of it. Um, so what we are doing is trying not to reinvent the wheel, but take as much hard work that has happened over the last, you know, decades, really, in the metadata field within education and apply that to our output. Um, Unfortunately, the, given the framework that schema.org is in, um, it, you can't just simply take the same syntax from the old metadata formats like Triple E LOM and all those, but we will use the same groupings of terms. So in the end, um, the, really the, the question that is, is, comes after this is how much work will it take to convert our metadata from Dublin Core, I Triple E LOM, whatever, to schema.org and the answer, ideally, is not very much. It will be a script, for the most part, for most people. Um, there will be a fairly easy mapping between the previous metadata models to the schema.org metadata model. Um, but also, a part of that is, is a really note that schema.org is not meant to replace your very rich metadata. Um, schema.org has the stated goal of not being the semantic web. So for those of you that know what that means, it means that they don't want to describe everything in excruciating detail. They want to purely describe the things that make it easier for people to search and find things, the things that they want. Um, this, the reason why this was started by Google, Bing, and Yahoo 
should tell you something that you know we're working towards making the lives of internet searchers through those search engines easier. How can we get them to get to our resources quicker um, and to the right resources? So with that in mind, we have a much more limited set of terms that will be approved through schema.org, is my assumption, than what you can have in the IEEE ROM or things like that. Um, so don't throw away your old metadata. <laughs> Simply map it to the new schema.org LRMI metadata, and then Google will index that. But then also, whatever other systems you have in place can use your previous, more rich metadata that's already available. Okay, and just great. To, just, to, just to reiterate that, I, I thought that that was something that was really an important point to make, that this idea of looking at what is out there and finding sort of the common terminology to make it easy for for people to to align with LRMI it seemed to to us and to be a very reasonable approach. And, and that is the reason why we have been trying to, um, you know, get out the message that for those of you who have such frameworks or, or, or have use cases that it, it's for you to decide whether it is to your advantage or not. Um, but certainly if, if you want what you have in use to be considered in, in terms of um, do, doing this sort of a, an, an assimilation and, and, and amalgamation and review, then um, we, you need to go to the, uh, to the um, Google, Mike. It's the it's the Google email. It's the email address that um, the link rather that we showed earlier, and we'll make sure that everybody gets that after this uh, after this session. But there's a very easy way to um, to do that. And I just to ask you a question. Um, you don't mean that anyone's actual framework would be published in its entirety, do you? Or, or do you mean that the synthesis of all of them would be made public? What we will make public is what they submit via their use case. Um, so the more detailed, the better, so we know what terms they use and what the definitions of those terms are, so we can make sure our terms match those. Um, mm -hmm. And I think many times the, the secret sauce of proprietary information isn't always in um, those that list of terms. It, it's how those terms are used in the back end. So mm -hmm. um, whatever people can share, the better. Um, but of course, just, just make sure that if you do share something with me directly that you don't want public, just make an explicit note of that. Um, mm -hmm. I will unfortunately have to assume that everything else is able to be shared um, just because by virtue of sharing it with a group of 15 technical working group members, we'll, we'll be basically sharing it with um, everyone. So, um, And then ideally we put it on the, the public mailing list of the um, schema.org people that are going to be reviewing our proposal. They're going to want to know why we recommended what we recommended, and if we have this material to back us up, you know, well, this is what, um, you know, Encyclopedia Britannica uses with their uh, metadata framework, and, and it's, you know, been useful over the last however many years, then that has a lot more weight and will most likely be easier, more easily approved than if we just said, well, because some people said something. <laughs> yeah. But those those who share the data um, would understand that um, not necessarily every aspect is going to be shared unless that's something they consent to. Exactly, it's all it's all informed consent. <laughs> okay, thanks. Okay, should we move on to the next question? Um, the next one would be: How will previous educational vocabularies be incorporated or built upon? No, I think we answered that. But Did you answer that one? No. Perhaps not. I mean, if there's... Um, if, you, if you feel like you answered it, that, that works for me. Um, one we'll, question is, can someone, if we have not answered it, is it possible for whoever asked it to um, indicate that? Otherwise, we can continue. Yes, they can send me a message if, that, if they would want a little bit more information. Um, the next question would be, will LRMI hurt small businesses or help them with online sales? Well, I mean, I, I will be happy to take a first pass at that. 
I, I think that in some ways LRMI could level the playing field for um, small businesses because everyone um, it, it, with improved discoverability, it actually does make the the opportunity to be discovered precisely by someone uh, look, by someone looking for precisely what you have um, that much easier. So um, my sense is that it it is a it's a it's an equalizer, not a uh, not a hindrance. Yeah, I would just second that. Actually, it's it's. Um in fact, you could think that the uh, the smaller publishers, can, if they're a little bit more nimble, they can they can um, uh, implement the new RMI metadata framework quickly, and then they'll get the new search results as soon as Google starts indexing that metadata. I mean, but once everybody starts indexing this, the same metadata and, and incorporating their framework, um, it'll, as Charlene said, just level the playing field so that everyone is as easily findable and discoverable as everyone else. Okay. Um, we had another question. We have a listener from New Zealand, and they have translated their metadata schema, um, and they wanted to know what the goals are for supporting other languages in schema.org. That's a, that's a very good question. Um, schema.org and the metadata framework is language agnostic. Um, the terms that you can fill in to the descriptions of the properties, you know, like what is the description of or the topic of this resource um, can obviously be in whatever language that it needs to be in. Um, the search engines have stated that they will be in, you know, the language of the resource doesn't matter. In fact, um, if you're talking about a um, non-English resource and you're searching for a non-English resource, the non-English resource will come up before the English resource. And I think we're ready to move on to the next question, which is, has any thought been given to using the common core standards as a basis for tagging? Yeah, um, a lot, really. Um, so one of the terms that we're coming up with is going to basically be competency slash standard or skill. And with that, we're not going to predefine or enumerate the list of available terms in that. We'll just say, the value for this term should be a competency or skill that is defined somewhere else. Um, we're basically offloading that because we don't want to be completely US centric. Um, we don't want to just do Common Core. We also want to do all the other um, standards out there, competency standards and, and education standards. Um, so we want to make it as flexible as possible for that reason. Um, but one of the things that we will do is once the framework is in place, once the basic terms have been um, solidified, we will start working with various community members that are experts with the various education standards and creating that enumerated list of the available terms for that. Um, I know we're working with a few people or in discussions with a few people um, that the Gates Foundation has, is working with about creating the enumeration of Common Core standards, because from my uh, admittedly um, very amateur knowledge of the Common Core standards, um, there are many, many, many variations of how the terms can be created. Um, you know, like there's reading comprehension for whatever grade, but then it is there's also a third switch that can be applied to that standard about how difficult the text was. So it, it gets complicated quickly, but we're, we're working with experts in that field to create that enumerated list of the Common Core standards, um, initially just with the, the national standards, but then ideally in the future, all the state standards that have made their up to 15% um, modifications. So we'll make sure that all of those are also enumerated. Um, and then as well, all the other um, jurisdictions, countries, uh, educational standards as we can. And correct me if I'm um, I'm wrong, um, Greg. So that is very much a work in progress. That's something that will take much longer than the time frame that has been laid out right now. My my sense is that for the time within the time frame that has been described in in our presentation, really the goal is to create a very very lightweight 
um, scheme that will then be able to have these layers um, added under it over time. And uh, my my understanding, again, I'm looking for your that's that's exactly right. And that, that right now, for example, yeah. there have been only three sort of categories identified. And maybe you could elaborate on those a little, a little yeah. bit. Yeah, that'll probably clear up some confusion. Um, so, well, initially, yes, that, that is the goal, is to um, create that flexible and light framework for this. And then that can be easily built upon, then get that approved, and then start working on the, the parts that will be built on top of it, like the competency standards. Um, so as Charlene said, we, we have three main buckets or um, sets of terms that we will be proposing for inclusion in the schema.org. Um, and these are basically those things that we feel turn a resource from just any old resource into a learning resource. Um, so once one of these tags is applied to a resource, um, it will show up in an education-specific search. Um, so the first tag will be audience. Now, audience in our context will be things like teacher, student, parent, or grade two, um, things like that, middle school, whatever those specific audience type tags will be. Um, and then the second category will be the competency slash skills slash standards, uh, which I've talked about. And then the third one will be um, use or type of material, so whether or not that material is a um, presentation or a syllabus or a, you know, a class outline, is an assignment, and is it what kind of use is it for? Is it for group work? Is it for an assignment? Is it for solo work? Things like that. Um, so with those three categories, we can pretty much model the majority of the existing educational specific metadata standards out there. Um, and as you can tell, I mean, obviously, the, the conclusion of that is we will be um, overloading those terms. Like they'll be in those previous metadata schemas, they had much more nuanced terms between what the three that we have. But with Google, Bing, and Yahoo, they don't necessarily need all that nuance. They want the, the overarching stuff. So we'll have, a, again, a mapping from the previous metadata, educational metadata standards to whatever proposal we make. Um, now, and I listed those terms, but of course we're we're not yet at the final approval yet, so we'll see what happens between now and February. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then we have another question from someone that works on a college's vSpace instance, and they were wondering how can schema.org and LRMI be integrated into open content on vSpace institutional repositories? Basically, they want to know kind of what's in it for me as a librarian managing an institutional repository. Yeah, definitely. Um, so DSpace right now, I think out of the box, it supports Dublin Core. I think that's the, the, the main metadata that it wants its users to use. Um, be, I think because it communicates between the rest of all the other repositories through OAI, OAI PMH, which is a open repository standards that lets you ask repositories what it has in it. Um, and the standard that is used for, for that communication is Dublin Core. Um, so what we will make sure to have, definitely, is the mapping between Dublin Core and LRMI. So um, once we are closer to our final um, uh, proposal, we will begin working with as many um, projects as possible to incorporate support for LRMI. Um, one of those will obviously be DSpace um, and produce basically a plugin for DSpace that you can um, input. You know, at, we'll see how it works exactly, but most likely it will just suck in the Dublin Core metadata and push it over into an LRMI metadata framework and then publish both of those visual or um, in the metadata of the web page when uh, you know Google Bing or Yahoo starts scraping whatever you have online. Okay. Um, the next question is, how does the LRMI uh, initiative intersect with the shared learning infrastructure, which is also underway? Mm. Well, I'll I'll start with that. I think that it, in some ways it's a it's a first piece. 
um, it's a first step. It's a, it's a part of a larger idea that um, once people can find learning content um, um, easily, <coughs> that they would more easily be able to personalize instruction for individual students. And um, I know that the the shared learning initiative is one that is taking place at a, 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 a level with, with the states. And um, I think it's the CCSFO and NGA. I could be wrong about that. And, you know, there they're looking at what, you know, if we're able to find learning resources very quickly, quickly enough to be able to um, really, you know, implement them almost instantaneously for, for each student, then what else does that enable us to do? So, <clears throat> Excuse me. So I, I think that this is kind of an an essential, um, implicit first step in in being able to create a, a, a system in which not only can kids um, really receive what they need, but that educators and schools can receive feedback on you know how kids are advancing and and what's working. Perhaps you could correct my description, <laughs> Greg. I would say it's definitely... That, that's probably... Yeah, that, that's, that's about as good as I can do, honestly, <laughs> as well. <laughs> okay, and then we have a question um, about the publishing side of it. Uh, are publishers who provide paid content expected to adhere to the tagging standards as well? Well, no one's expected to adhere. <clears throat> it's going to be totally voluntary to to choose to um, to use the the system. I think the most important thing to understand is that if this is adopted by Schema.org, I mean, do you want to come up when um, you know someone does a search not for potato salad, but for you know I don't social studies, you know, grade four. Um, uh, Get, you know, software, I don't know. Uh, and I, I hope that those are purely top of the head kinds of sorts that I've just chosen. But the most important thing is that you, you know, it's your decision, really, on whether you want to sharpen your ability to be found on, you know, Google or Yahoo. It's not anything that is going to be in any way um, mandatory. I'm not saying that there won't be, um, I mean, I am speculating about once you can find um, learning resources that, you know, that that quickly and, and precisely, I, I would expect other, you know, market forces to come into play, but it, that would make you as a publisher really want to be engaged in that, but it is not mandatory. Great. Um, and then someone else was wondering if we could share a little bit more about the vocabulary that you've been considering. Yeah. Um, so those three. Oh wait. Yeah. Those three terms uh, that I described before are basically our synthesis of the previous metadata, educational metadata uh, schemas that we have worked with. Um, they. The next steps that we will be doing is taking those um, three terms and putting them into the schema.org um, ontology. So where they fit within the hierarchy of schema.org, there's a few options of, of how that might work. Um, basically, to a quick rundown, um, the top level uh, aspect of schema.org is actually a thing. And a thing can have a very limited number of properties. But then one of the next down levels is a creative work. Um, and a creative work has a lot of properties that would, you would think would apply to educational resources. And in fact, it has some subset um, uh, things that are also like articles or blog posts or book or movie, video, things like that. Um, so they will all 
those are basically all the things that we see are probably educational resources. So we will modify that creative work um, overarching thing. <laughs> it's weird to describe it as a thing in, in conversation because it sounds like I'm not being specific, but I'm actually being specific. Um, <laughs> so we will modify that, those terms and, and add our own in there and at that level so that all the underlying creative work, whatever is added in the future, if they add any more creative works types of properties, um, they will inherit the educational metadata as a part of the hierarchy, the way it works. Yeah, I mean, going back to the potato salad, um, you know, sort of an, an example, you know, they've identified, uh, you, know, you know, what ingredients and calories and, um, you know, what, what are sort of the, the essential things that are part of a recipe. And it's on a much larger scale and a much more complex scale, as you can imagine, is kind of the same task. What are the essential things that are part of an educational resource? And those are all the things that will ultimately fall out, I think, underneath these three broad categories. Great. Um, the next question is, how does or doesn't this effort relate to the learning registry? In other words, is it just a coincidence that you share similar abbreviations? <laughs> Um, yeah, yeah, we both use L and R. Um, so we actually have uh, one member at the place of face, uh, Steve McLee, who works on learning registry. Um, so we are... Sorry, Greg, we're losing you. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, we're related in the sense that the learning registry is supplying some expertise through Steve Midgley. And then also we're making sure that um, what we do makes sense in their world just as much as we do with any other person that supplies a use case or an organization that supplies a use case. Um, so we are of the same family, I guess, is, is how we can put it. But we're not, you know, we're, we're not a subdivision of or, or, you know, a part of each other. It's, it, they're two independent groups that have um, similar acronyms and are working in the education sphere in metadata. Okay, great. Um, and the next question is, will anyone in LRMI be developing tools, and then they said ideally open source, for transforming between metadata formats and for testing and evaluating the quality of published HTML? And then they said sort of like the Facebook lister. Yeah, um, ideally we're going to be doing some plugins for whatever public publishing platforms are already out there, like Drupal or WordPress or DSpace or whatever, what have you, that we can easily modify um, to support LRMI. Um, we'll see what kind of developer time we can get on that internal to Creative Commons or work with the community. Um, one of my tasks will be to create the documentation that will help others develop those plugins or modifications. Um, but then I think what will help all the rest of the world would just be our very explicit mappings between the previous metadata standards to LRMI. So you can, I mean, sucking in your old metadata and spitting it out into LRMI shouldn't be too difficult um, using a, a basic script. Um, any, you know, whoever is doing your metadata can probably take care of that um, if, if, if it's an internal uh, program that we won't be able to help <laughs> modify. Okay, um, and then someone else was wondering, will para data, for example, resource comments or click usage data, be covered by LRMI? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I'm going to say, again, that my understanding that these are all possible extensions of the work, um, but that the LRMI's task is fairly um, confined at this point, or, or uh, def defined, and that is basically around um, the vocabulary, and uh, not to say that these other extensions are not not only possible but probable. But right now, they're outside the scope of LRMI. And that is my understanding. But again, Greg, I'm listening to your comments as well. Yeah, uh, that's a very good um, summary. Like we initially put that as out of scope. Um, the project did for Paradata, 
Um, but with the conversation that happened on Wednesday at the schema.org workshop, um, it sounds like producing these types of extensions will be a fairly straightforward process in the future. Once, Basically, once we get through the process, the process will be fairly well defined because <laughs> we will be defining it as we go, basically, in conjunction with them. Um, so we're going to use the LRMI vocabulary as the groundbreaking work to then make sure that other extensions that build on top of this can can be made more easily. Um, and uh, there's there's experts within the technical working group on Paradata, Steve Midgley being one of those, um, and we'll definitely make sure that we're not going to um, preemptively make things complicated for that type of data. Okay, and then there's another question. Will Google's algorithm favor sites that incorporate the metadata? And they have an example, um, for example, in that interview. Go ahead. Yeah, they, they're they pretty tight-lipped about how they will change their results, um, you know, that whole competitive advantage thing. Like, they, they're actually, we, we, at the workshop on Wednesday, it was quite um, humorous to see the conversations between the people that are actually part of schema.org, but from different, uh, different companies, learning what they can and can't share during their meetings. Um, they all agree upon, like, what vocabulary they will consume, but they will never probably state exactly how they will display that information. Um, they all do it a little bit differently and, and all that. But what I've seen in practice is I can't say whether or not um, something is getting a better ranking, but it, if the metadata is there, um, the search result does look different than the other search results. It's not your usual bland title and quick little description of the page. It also includes some extra little bits of information like um, you've probably seen the, the websites that have like the table of contents sometimes listed out underneath the resource. So what it does is it um, visually attracts the, the searcher a little bit more when there's that call out information there. So that might be a non-answer in that we don't know what they're going to do, but we do know that when they do display the metadata, it does look spiffier <laughs> in a very layman's terms. Okay, and I think this might end up being our last question, and I know there were a few other questions that didn't get answered, so we will certainly be following up with you after the webinar here. So last question for Charlene and Greg. Is there a trade-off between flexibility and interoperability, and what would be more important between those two to LRMI? Well, I think There's always a trade-off between flexibility. <laughs> yeah. But isn't, Greg, I mean, to some degree, the, the larger goal, it is interoperability. I mean, if, if the LRMI became sort of a standard, would, wouldn't that essentially be the same as, um, in some ways, uh, interoperability, or am I missing the point of the question? Um, I, I think what we see is that there will always be a trade-off between interoperability and, and flexibility and, and um, verboseness and all that. Because to be interoperable, you, you have to limit yourself to what others can work with as well, right? Um, but what we're making sure is that while we are a limited set of terms vis-a-vis -vis the other very verbose um, schemas out there, we will make sure that what we do does not um, prohibit the use of other schemas. So one thing that Google has made explicit, Google, Bing, and Yahoo um, have made explicit, is that a web page can include both schema.org metadata, the microdata on there, and also whatever else you use to describe the material, whatever metadata framework is, is already in place. They um, won't you know, discount the whole page because you use two different languages. Um, so basically, it's we're trying to ride that line of the best solution for everyone where we're going to help make the standard that Google, Bing, and Yahoo will support and thus be a quasi de facto standard in some areas. But when you do need to talk about things much more verbosely or nuanced and use your own schema, you can do that without harming anything else. 
Thank you, Greg. I think I did miss the point, absolutely. <laughs> that helps me understand. You're welcome. Okay, are there any last uh, comments from Greg or Charlene before we wrap up? Well, well I just thank you very much for coming. And I, I would like to echo that. We had great attendance, lots of questions, and um, we want to keep receiving those questions. Just remind folks that we will follow up with a reminder of, of um, how to go about submitting a use case or framework if you'd like, and also a reminder about where to find um, the LRMI website, which will launch shortly. Thank yeah, you, everyone. <laughs> yeah, and my name is Erin Gross, and I'm with the Winner Group. And on behalf of the Winner Group and AEP and Creative Commons, we just want to thank everybody for joining us today. And we will send out a link to the archived webinar uh, probably early next week. So thank everybody for your time, and um, I think that's all we have. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.